Hi everyone, my name's Jen, I'm an author and a book reviewer and I'm here today to talk to you about all the books that I read in July. I have 14 in front of me to talk to you about. I read an extra, I think between 10 and 15 for work, which I'm not going to speak about today because they weren't ones that I had chosen to read myself. But July was a little bit of a letdown for me. How was your reading month? Did you find things that you really enjoyed reading? I feel like I've had such a good reading year this year so far. I think I had a bit of a blip reading month in, I want to say February, and I feel like this month, or rather last month, was a similar deal. There were a couple of books, a couple of books I did really like, but on the whole, on the whole, if I can speak, I was feeling a little bit flat about what I was reading, including a couple of books that I was massively anticipating, which I think made me feel worse about everything. Anyway, let's not, let's not be depressing about it. Let's just chat because there were some there were some good bits, um, and I would love to know what you have been reading, and also if you have read any of these books and what you thought about them too. Where should we start? Let's start here with this little book, which is To Mush by Sven Holm, which is translated from the Danish by Sylvia Clayton. This is a reissued classic published by Faber Editions and I have been enjoying reading these titles. They're very short and I read this one, I chose to read it because this month for Toast I did one of my seasonal walk and reading articles. So every month I write a bookish article for Toast which is a clothing company but they have a magazine too and normally I'll review um, say three recent releases but every season this year I have been going on a walk and then I've been writing about that walk and taking photos and leaving a map in case anyone is near the areas that I'm walking in and wants to do that walk too and I'll take a book on the walk and I'll read it as I go so I write about the walk and the book I will link this in the description box down below if you want to go read it I read this walking from King's Cross Word on the Water which is a bookshop on a boat doesn't have a bookshop on a boat uh, near King's Cross and then I walked along Regent's Canal which is one of my favourite things to do to Regent's Park so it was a shortish walk about an hour long and I stopped at various points along the way and read this because this is only 115 pages I'd been really anticipating this one because it sounded to me from the blurb that it was going to be like White Lotus at the end of the world which is what it is and I did enjoy reading it but I think I had assumed it was going to be more plot heavy than it actually is. So this is set after nuclear disaster and it's about an unnamed narrator who was one of a group of really rich people who as an insurance policy bought um, a room in this place called Tamush, which is a seaside resort along with radiation chambers to protect them from the world. If everything fell apart, it did fall apart. Now all the rich people are in this seaside resort and all the people who did not have money are trying to get in and our unknown narrator is at the top of this building looking out of his window seeing all of these people dying outside and wondering why he doesn't feel worse than he does he's almost trying to trick himself into feeling guilty and he's also hating on other characters in the book for not showing more compassion He's waiting for himself to do the right thing and then is kind of appalled when he doesn't see himself doing it but is more appalled with other characters in the, in the book who are also not helping people who need help. This came out eight years before J.G. Ballard's High Rise and there are definitely similarities between the two but that one is much more plot heavy. This one is just philosophical, existential crises about world crises and um how humans are not that great of a species which i feel like we probably already knew there is a jet lag feeling to the writing style in this book and i think that suits what's going on because i imagine that the narrator is not really getting much sleep feels like he's walking around in a daze and there's a massive sense of detachment i would recommend this book for fans of john wyndham i have been a fan of john wyndham myself in the past i haven't read any of his novels in ages though so i wonder if i still would be but anyway i did enjoy enjoy reading this book but i think i expected more drama between the people who are staying in this 
apartment block, I expected more interaction, more backstory, and we don't get that. But if you're happy for just inner monologue, distantly observing what's going on in the world, then this definitely is for you. After that, I decided to read two more TM Logan books. I discovered him this year because I found his work on a list of if you enjoy Nikki French books, that is me, then you will enjoy Tim Logan's books. The first book of his that I read was The Curfew. Um, I didn't read that last month, it's the first one I read this year. This remains my favourite by him, which I guess is a little bit of a disappointment because when you discover a new author and you love the first book that you read, you really get excited and think, oh, maybe I'm going to love all the others just as much. That hasn't been the case yet. There are still others of his that I haven't read yet, and maybe I will love those just as much. But just in case you also went to the curfew after I spoke about it and loved it, um, yeah, I haven't been as excited by his other books. TM Logan writes psychological thrillers, and the first one that I read in July was this. It's called Trust Me. This is about a woman called Ellen who is on a train going back to London after having a not very good session at an IVF clinic where she's been told that she's very unlikely to ever have children. She's been having IVF treatment for several years. Her husband recently left her and she just saw on Instagram that her now ex-husband and his new partner are expecting their first baby. Basically, she wants to be left alone, please, on this train. She does not want to be talking to people. But then she sits down opposite a woman who has a young baby who's called Mia. This woman keeps on getting text messages that are making her very uneasy, her phone keeps ringing, and then finally she says to Ellen, sorry, would you mind holding Mia a second? I need to take this phone call. Ellen doesn't really want to hold the baby. She doesn't really want to be around babies right now, but she says, okay, fine, I will do that for you. So the woman hands Mia to Ellen, goes to take the phone call. Then the train pulls in at a station and Ellen looks out the window and sees the woman leaving the train, has left Mia and a bag of all her stuff with Ellen on the train and she doesn't know what to do. She now is holding this baby and the woman whose baby she presumes it is has left. She discovers a note in the baby bag that says, where is it? It's on the back. Please protect Mia. Don't trust the police. Don't tell anyone. And she doesn't know what she should do. Something that made me a little bit anxious when I was reading this book is Ellen becomes very attached to Mia very quickly. And I was super worried it was gonna turn into, oh, crazy lady who can't have children decides to steal baby. <laughs> um, it does not turn into that. It definitely is leading you into thinking that at the beginning, but basically it's playing with that not very nice trope. And a lot of other characters in this book believe that of Ellen. They think that she has maybe stolen a baby because she's not in a good mental health headspace. And it's about her, excuse me, disproving everybody else. There were some parts of this book that I found a little bit unbelievable. It was very tense. I did guess who the bad guy was earlier than I would have liked to. Um, so yeah, it, it wasn't a favorite. It did grip me. It did also have me rolling my eyes at several points. But I did enjoy it. And then I listened to another book by him as well. That one is called 29 Seconds. And the premise of this one was really good. It's about a woman who is a lecturer and everyone who works at her university knows that there is a very lecherous lecturer who works there who they will never be alone with because he has assaulted women in the past. He's always got away with it. If you've read the Nikki French um, Frida Klein books, he's very much like Bradshaw, but also a predator. And this man is making our protagonist's life a nightmare. Coupled with that, her husband has recently left her. And then when she's driving to pick up her kids one day from school, she witnesses um, a failed attempted kidnap of a young girl and she reports it to the police, but the police, it's not that they don't really believe her, but there were no other witnesses and all parties involved fled the scene. So they have no evidence to go on. She then receives a phone call from the father of the girl who was going to be kidnapped saying, I am in your debt. I can make someone that you know and don't like disappear. Would you like me to do that? as a thank you. In fact, he doesn't even phrase it as a, would you like me to do that? It's a, you must let me do that because I do not like being in your debt. So she has to decide what she wants to do with that responsibility. It has some twists in that I did not 
see coming. But there was one thing in the book that really did ruin a big section of it for me. Um, there is a character who is referred to just constantly as the scarred man. And our main character is very afraid of him for no reason other than he has a scar that runs all the way down his face. He turns up on campus one day and she calls the police and she says to the police, there is a really terrifying, violent man here. And they say, well, who is he? What does he look like? She said, I don't know who he is, but he has this horrible scar all the way down his face. And I appreciate that there are people out there who say not very nice things about people who have scars on their face and make that villainy link. It's definitely also being made in the book as well, the way that it's written. Um, I would have appreciated maybe a character in the book calling her out and saying, well, you can't say that this man is scary because he has a facial disfigurement. It's a pet peeve of, peeve of mine. We know this. I do not like the link between villainy and disfigurement. I think it's lazy. And yeah, having that label of just the scarred man for a huge section of this book, frankly annoyed me <laughs> very much. It's the first time I've encountered that with his work. I haven't seen him do that anywhere else. So I'm hoping that that is just a one-off. But yeah, I didn't love that aspect of the book. So none of the books by him that I've read so far have touched the curfew. So if you're looking for a psychological thriller recommendation, that's the one I would recommend. And as I have mentioned in the past, that particular audiobook is narrated by Richard Armitage, which is just plus points, is it not? Then in July, I did a reading vlog where I tried to read a whole bookshelf from my bookcase and I asked you to vote on which bookcase, which bookcase, which bookshelf, not a whole bookcase, you wanted me to read. I recorded a reading vlog about that, which I'll link in the description box down below. I ended up reading eight of them, though three of them ended up being DNFs. As I've spoken about them already, I'll just whiz through these as a recap. So firstly, I decided to part ways with No One Is Here Except All Of Us by Ramona Osabel, which is a novel I've had on my shelves for so many years, and I think I've tried to read it about five times. The reason I kept clinging onto it, hoping I would love it another time I picked it up, is because I really loved her short story collection, A Guide to Being Born, but sadly this one just wasn't for me. Or maybe it would have been for me eight or nine years ago. I think just my reading tastes have changed quite a bit. Then I tried Astral Travel by Elizabeth Baines, which is a novel about a woman who is writing a novel about her father's life after his death. And I admired the writing style and the scope of this story, but I wasn't drawn to pick it up again and again. I think I said I would recommend it for fans of Demon Copperhead and also for fans of Claire Fuller's writing as well. I think there was lots to admire about this. It just wasn't one that I was particularly drawn to. Then this was, let me turn this around because this is a proof with the cover on the back. It says, Before We Were Innocent by Ella Berman. This is about two women who, when they were teenagers, went to Greece with a friend of theirs called Evangeline and Evangeline ended up dying and they were vilified in the press. And now in the modern day or their modern day, 2018, Joni, who's one of the women, her girlfriend has gone missing. And she asks Bess, the protagonist, for an alibi, claiming she hasn't done anything wrong. And Bess owes her, so she gives her that alibi. Um, I wasn't compelled to keep reading this one because it is about very rich, privileged people. And half of this is set during their summer in Greece. And I just didn't enjoy reading about 18 year olds with so much money and no responsibility. Um, I don't know what it was about it, but also I've also read several books with similar premises that I have enjoyed. Sorry, I don't know what my voice is doing today, which I have enjoyed much more. One of those being Eliza Clark's Penance, which is a fake true crime book, which is actually a novel. And that is set in a working class community in the Northeast of England. And again, it's about teenage girls and about the harm that they can do to each other. And I just enjoyed that so much more that this one I think shrank when I was reading it. Um, if you enjoy The Secret History, I would recommend this one. If you enjoy um, Paper Palace, I would recommend this book. I think so many people would absolutely love it. I think it's gonna be a huge book in the summer, but I am just not one of those people. Then I read Longbourn by Joe Baker, which is a Pride and Prejudice retelling focusing on the servants who work at Longbourn. I thought there was a lot to admire in this book, but I had such pacing issues with the text. And also 
I didn't really believe in the romance that was spoken about. I loved that slavery was discussed and where people's money was coming from, but I didn't think it was explored in enough depth to be um, substantial. I would have liked more from that commentary. I spoke about it more in the vlog, which is linked down below. However, in more positive news, I really enjoyed The Stickleback Catches by Lizette Alton, which is a middle grade book about a young girl called Mimi whose grandma has dementia and she's really, really worried about it. And this is reflected in her seeing cracks appearing on the ceiling and she has to go on a quest to try and find memories, but she's aware that maybe this quest is futile. It's also about finding friends. It has queer representation and also disability representation in here too. And it was just a warm hug as Lizette books often are. Then I read Permafrost by Eva Balthasar, which is translated from the Catalan by Julia Sanchez. This is about an unnamed woman who is fed up with the mundanity of existing and she wants to tear everything apart. It's very funny, also very dry and gets dark in places as well. It's a queer story, it's a coming of age story, um, very tongue in cheek and it's the first in a loose trilogy with similar characters, the second of which was Boulder, which was long listed for this year's International Booker Prize. I'm not sure which one out of the two I preferred, I also think that maybe the protagonists are perhaps a little bit too similar, their voices do bleed into each other, but I do like her writing style in general. My second favourite from that reading vlog was We Had To Remove This Post by Hannah Barefoots, which is translated from the Dutch by Emma Rolt. This is a novel about a woman called Kaylee who gets a job working as a content moderator and she's looking at all these awful things that people are posting online and she has to decide what should be deleted and what shouldn't be deleted and it's really affecting her mental health. It's also affecting her colleagues as well. Some of them start to believe some of the far right content that they're looking at on a daily basis. Some of them become flat earthers. Some of them start to break rules around the office and you can feel that this is gonna escalate into something pretty damaging. The ending of this book I thought was perfect. It is such a short book. It is talking about horrifying things, but not in a huge amount of detail. I didn't feel like it was gratuitous. Um, Self-harm is talked about, I would say, more than other forms of abuse in here. So if that's a no-go area for you, then maybe don't pick it up. My favourite from that reading vlog though, and it was a triumph because I think this is one of my favourite books of the year, is The Hierarchies by Roz Anderson. I was so glad that I did this challenge actually because this has been sitting on my shelf for a few years and it's probably not a book I would have picked up in the near future. So I'm glad that I picked it up. It's about an AI, an android called Sylvie, who has been created for a man who she calls her husband. She lives in the attic of his house. In the main part of his house, there's his wife. And as the novel progresses, they have a son as well. It is commenting on that mad woman in the attic, Victorian, idea um, and it's also very reminiscent of Clara and the Sun, Never Let Me Go, The Handmaid's Tale, Stepford Wives, Valley of the Dolls. Sylvie starts to become more aware and she finds notes from her previous software selves written in binary which give her clues as to what's going on in the rest of the house. One of these notes she discovers one day tells her that she should run. So it's about her finding out more about the outside world. It's about the war between created women and born women and how men are pitting them against each other. I thought that there was so much to talk about in this book um, and I loved it. So that was one that I loved from that reading vlog. And then finally, there were three other books that I read in July. Two of them were disappointments one of them was not. The biggest disappointment for me was this, which I'm sure you're gonna see knocking around so much on BookTube. This is The List by Yomi Edegoke. And I pre-ordered this one because there was so much hype around it. The premise is amazing. It's about a woman called Ola who works for a women's magazine. She is shortly going to be married to a man that she loves very much. And there has been this private list circulating around the industry of abusive men to avoid. And then one day that list is made public and Ola discovers that her soon to be husband is on that list. And then she has to try and work out if she knows nothing about him and he is not the man that she thought she knew or if someone is framing him. I don't often lean into hype surrounding a book. I kind of like to 
read extracts and reviews. So because I pre-ordered this one, because I was sucked into the hype, I didn't read any sample of the writing and that is my bad. I should have waited because I think if I had read a sample chapter from this book, I would have known it wasn't for me. So that was a mistake on my part. I have now learned. So whilst the premise is extremely exciting, and I should say the reason that I pre-ordered it is because I was sucked into the yellow face hype, yellow face by Rebecca F. Quam, and I pre-ordered that one without having read a sample of it. And I ended up loving that one. So I think I was just feeling really good about trusting hype. Um, but whilst the premise of this is really fantastic, I just did not enjoy the writing style. I feel like there are too many adjectives. It feels very, very clunky. And it's just, it's not the kind of writing that I enjoy reading. So I'm really sad about this. I'm gonna make sure that it goes to a good home. I'm sure that lots of other people will absolutely adore it. It is a huge title. It doesn't need me to love it, but I really did want to love it, you know? Um, then I read Y slash N by Esther Yi. This is, or was, on the pile of books that I was super excited to read this year that relate somehow to social media and fandom because that has been my catnip this year. And I have read so many great books on those topics such as The Subtweet by Vivek Shreya and Idle Burning and well, I guess Yellow Face as well. Um, so this one is about an unnamed woman who doesn't care about K-pop actually, but then her friend, brings her along to a concert with a band that she really loves and she sees them perform for the first time and becomes completely obsessed with this singer who she calls Moon. Y slash N is a space in fandom. It's a type of fandom where you can insert yourself into the story. So you can insert your name and then it will autofill into all the parts of the story where a name will appear. And uh, protagonist starts to write fan fiction about Moon, inserting herself into the story. But then there's a real blur between where this fan fiction ends and where her life begins. And that becomes more and more pronounced as the book progresses. I think that it's such an interesting thing to do. And the thing that really confused me about this book is that there were lots of really beautiful paragraphs that I underlined. Let me find you an example. The pack of boys called their fans livers because we weren't just expensive handbags they carried around. We kept them alive like critical organs. I suspected they used the English word liver because it sounded like lover. They could be coy like that, but I would much rather be Moon's liver than lover. So there's beautiful moments like that. The imagery is wonderful. And then there'll be really, really clunky sentences Basically, it feels like the author went to a thesaurus and picked out the longest word that they could use about a given situation. And it just makes the reader stumble. And I didn't enjoy that. It felt massively overwritten. And then I thought, is this deliberate? Because is the protagonist not a great writer? Is she writing really clunkily? And that's the fan fiction. And then when it's the really beautiful writing, we've come out of the fan fiction again. And when I thought that, I thought, well, that could be really clever. But then it didn't really match up. And there didn't really seem to be a reason for that that was reliable. So I had to relinquish that idea. So I think really just overall, it's a very, for me, unbalanced story as in the writing doesn't feel consistent not in a way that would make sense with the fan fiction being included just in a way that was a bit perplexing and distracting perhaps because I've also read other books like Idle Burning on a very similar topic that I adored again this book kind of paled in comparison I'm sad about it but we can't love every book we read. So that is that one. And then finally, I read My Husband by Maud Venturo, which is translated from the French by Emma Ramadan. This is a twisted book about a woman who is the wife, who is obsessed with the idea of her husband. She doesn't like to show him that she's obsessed with him. She has rules for herself. She knows that she's in love with the idea of being in love. She thinks that every day of the week symbolizes a color and that color represents how that particular day is gonna go. She punishes her husband for things that he does wrong in air quotes. If he doesn't respond in a particular way, she feels as though she has to hide his possessions from him, for instance. They have two children together and she tolerates her children, but definitely would prefer they were out of the way so that she could have more alone time with her husband. The premise of this, again, is wonderful. The first half, I felt dragged a little bit. It really ramps up in the second half, and I thought the ending 
was brilliant. The ending is one of those endings that makes you reflect on the whole book differently and I really do enjoy it when that happens. I do, however, to be fair to this book, think that again it has fallen victim to being a little bit similar to a book that I absolutely love and that book is Mrs March by Virginia Fito which is about a woman who's married to a man who's a novelist and he's very famous so she gets very jealous of all his acquaintances and then someone tells her one day that they think that she has been written in as a character in his latest book and that character is not very flattering so she decides she has to try and find out why her husband would do such a thing and that book has all the elements of this book the controlling the paranoia but also has that added 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 plot which i thought took the book even further i think in places this book was lacking some plot, especially in the first half, I felt as though, okay, I get this dynamic, I understand it, I would like this to move forward so that we can see how these characters can react to outside situations instead of just being inside their heads all the time. I would guess that this book has been inspired by Mr. Bridge and Mrs. Bridge, which were two novels published, I want to say in the 1950s, let me check that. Mm. It was published in 1959, uh, it's written by Evan S. Connell, that's Mrs. Bridge. I think that was the first one, which was a novel about a woman called Mrs. Bridge and her observations of her husband and her family. And then following that, there was a novel called Mr. Bridge, which told a similar story from his perspective. So I would guess that this was inspired by that. Um, I do think it was saved by the ending. I did not end up feeling disappointed by this book at all once I finished it. In fact, I would be intrigued to maybe even start from the beginning and read it again. However, I did think this could be one of my favourite books of the year based on the blurb. And it's not going to be one of my absolute favourites, but definitely worth it. And if the premise intrigues you, and I would say especially if you haven't read Mrs March by Virginia Fito, I think that you would really, really like this. So those are all the books that I read in July that I wanted to chat to you about. I will list them in the description box down below. I would love to know if you have read any of these or if you would like to now that you've heard me chat about them. Um, I would love it if you could subscribe to this channel if you are new and you enjoyed this video and also if you enjoy my content and you have the means to and would like to consider supporting me on Patreon that would be very kind. Patreon is a place where you can tip creators and the support over there allows me to keep creating free videos for everyone here and funds my time making videos accessible by creating captions and all of that good stuff. I hope you're all doing well and I will be back for another video next weekend. Bye!